More than 250 participants have already joined. I think we can start now or should I wait a few minutes more? We can start, Dr. Rakim. Okay, thank you. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second session of uh, a series of lectures of, on steel structures. Uh, I, I, I believe that most of you have uh, uh, participated in yesterday's session. So yesterday we covered the basic concepts of structural steel design, uh, all the basic premises uh, that we need for regular design of uh, individual structural components like for design for tension, design for compression, design for flexure, design for shear, and design for torsion. And the uh, building code requirements that uh, provided in BNBC 2020, we have uh, somewhat touched upon those topics. Now, today is kind of advanced. Uh, part of uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, so there are many other topics that uh, actually that should be covered and uh, my intention was to cover many topics but finally I've realized that it is it will, it's very difficult to cover all the topics that are mentioned in the code. So I had to be selective. I have uh, I have selected basically three topics, uh, some, uh, some aspects of connection and then direct analysis method and seismic provisions. Now, to be honest, if I uh, want to do justice to any of these topics, I should devote the whole lecture only on one topic. But uh, as you can understand that we want to get a flavor of all these different topics. So I'll touch upon these three topics. I, I had no other choice but to leave many other topics like um, evaluation of existing structure, uh, design for serviceability, and inelastic design of seal structures. So I couldn't cover these topics. So hopefully in future, in, uh, in another occasion, we can cover those topics. Now today, let's start. Okay. So I'll start. So yesterday, we talked about uh, different, uh, the classification of connections like simple connection, fully restrained connection, partially restrained connection. Today, we'll talk um, more about how we connect different elements of different members and what are the ways. So basically, there are two ways. One is welding and another is bolting. Now, first, let's talk about welding. So there are um, different types of welding. But for uh, the in the building code, basically these three types of welds are mentioned. One is groove weld, as shown in the left picture, that we first create groove uh, in the parent material, the, the members that we want to connect. We prepare a groove, then we weld on that groove. That is groove weld. Second type is fillet weld. So we place uh, the members uh, one, one of another in different angles. It may, they may be in different angles. It's shown here is in right angle, 90 degrees. So we can place one plate on another plate like this and we weld from the side. That's fillet weld. The third type is plug weld and slot weld. Plug weld is like 
we uh, keep a home in uh, we we for, we keep a hole in one plate and we weld in that hole, hole and create a plug so that one plate doesn't move from the from another plate and the hole may not be uh, just circular it can be elongated in that case we call term that slot weld so these are different types of welds now groove weld uh, there can be three types of groove welds. One is complete joint penetration groove weld, CJP, where we weld from the bottom of the uh, thickness, from the bottom, and we gradually come to the top of the weld. And usually we keep some material uh, below bottom and some material above top and then uh, we grind so that is complete joint penetration and partial joint penetration when there is situation that we cannot go to the bottom of the thickness we leave some part of the parent material at the bottom we don't uh, weld the full extent of the thickness that's called partial joint penetration weld. And flare weld is when we have a situation like uh, one member, one plate is bent on another, or both the plates may be uh, bent from both sides. Then at that joint, if we weld, that is flare weld. So these are different types, types of groove weld. Now, uh, groove weld can we can uh, have in three four different positions one is flat when both the plates are horizontal flat in the same plane another is uh, horizontal position that the plates may be in an inclined position or vertical but the but the axis of the weld is horizontal the second picture that is horizontal position the plates are vertical but the weld the alignment of the axis of the weld is horizontal that's horizontal position and vertical position is when the weld itself is the alignment of the axis of the weld is vertical that is vertical position overhead po position is uh, like if we want to weld from bottom uh, under a roof like that or the uh, top flange where um, offer after we are welding from the bottom and uh, situation like that that's overhead position and these are different positions of groove welds and partial joint penetration can be of different types from the shape of the uh, groove we term them J groove V groove U groove or bevel groove. Uh, among them, V groove and bevel groove, they're straight cuts. Uh, but the angle of these cuts may be different. V groove may be 45 degree V groove or 60 degree V groove. Similarly, bevel groove can be 45 degree bevel groove or 60 degree bevel groove. Now, uh, the process of welding. There are different processes of welding. The most usual one that we see at uh, the size uh, where we have an electrode, stick of electrode, that's called shielded metal arc welding, SMAW. And so that, that's the manual arc welding that we quite often see in this, at the sides. Another one is gas arc metal welding. Uh, here an inert gas, uh, metal inert gas, MIG where it is used as electrode. The electrode itself is, uh, uh, the, the, that is MIG electrode and between the electrode and the uh, base metal arc is formed. So we'll have pictures uh, and we'll see that how what are, what are the differences 
flux code well arc welding uh, this is automatic type we have machines we need machines for this one uh, this type of welding uh, and the electrode is is tubular like tube and it contains flasks and there is constant voltage so that's why you need a machine for that uh, there can be two types of uh, shilling. Uh, one is FCAWG, another is FCAWS. Um, in FCAWG, uh, the shielding gas is supplied through a gas nozzle. And in FCAWS, shielding gas is obtained exclusively from the flux. It uh, comes from, uh, from the flux. Another uh, uh, type of arc welding is submerged arc welding, SRW, that is um, the, usually you can find this type of welding in the factories, uh, not at the sites. So this is submerged type. Let's see some pictures. So for, at the top left, that's the stick welding that uh, SMAW that is uh, usual type of welding, manual arc welding that is the top left. Uh, top right, uh, to, uh, bottom left is the, uh, that is with MIG, metal um, inert gas welding. So you see the, the electrode is inside, electrode is number three here inside a tube and that tube is uh, connected to the electric supply. So a little bit different but that is also doable at sites and top uh, top right is the FCAW type. So if we have a gas nozzle then this is FCAW uh, G type. So we have a gas nozzle and uh, flux core wear and uh, arc is produced. This is also doable at the site, but you need a machine for this. Uh, the, it comes with a machine. And the bottom right is uh, the submerged type, submerged arc welding, SAW. So you need big facility for that. You cannot do that at site. Usually that's done at factories. So these are different types of welding. Why am I saying all these? Uh, because we have tables in our code where depending on the welding process and the position of groove weld uh, and for uh, partial uh, joint penetration, PJP type of uh, or groove welding, Depending on the type of PJP, the, uh, we have to define the effective throat. Now, why we need the effective throat? From the effective throat, we can calculate the effective area of welding. Why do we need the effective area, area of welding? To calculate the capacity of welding. So basically, in, uh, at welding, the shear is generated, and we have to multiply the shear Cap, uh, shear strength with the area, then we'll get the capacity. So for that we need to know, we need to define the effective throat. Multiplied by the length is effective area. So to determine effective throat, we need to know what type of weld welding is this, what is the, what position of welding is this, and what is the welding process. Then only we can define uh, the effective throat. In most of the cases, effective throat is the depth of groove, but in some cases, like for usual manual welding, uh, if the uh, bevel, if uh, this is PJP, uh, uh, usual manual type welding uh, for any groove location, uh, we have to deduct three millimeters from the uh, depth of groove, like that. So, we need to consult this table to calculate effective throat. Now, uh, for flare bevel groove, 
and fair V groove, uh, there is another table. Depending on the radius of flaring, uh, we can calculate the effective throat size, effective well size, that is effective throat. Now in uh, BNBC we have uh, requirements of minimum weld size. So depending on the thickness of the base metal, we have to know what should be the minimum effective throat thickness. This is minimum. We can uh, provide more. Uh, it will come from our calculation, but there is a minimum. If the from calculation we need less amount of welding, we cannot do that. We have to give this amount. This is the minimum. So for different depths and depending on the uh, welding type, like the, uh, the upper table is for PGP, groove weld, and the bottom one is for fillet weld. And to calculate capacity, uh, there is uh, our code comes with another table and in this table uh, depending on the filler material we know the electrode is the filler material for the stick well uh, depending on the filler material and the strength of the filler material and uh, welding type we can uh, get the strength of the welding material like for <clears throat> here this is for PGP partial joint penetration uh, it shows uh, what should be the value of uh, capacity reduction factor what should be the value of uh, safety factor and what should be the value of strength FY or 0.6 FY so it's it's given there and what section in the code should we uh, follow to calculate the capacity it is also given in this table so like this this is the table now that was um, about welding now we'll talk a little bit about bolts so um, mainly high strength bolts that in uh, while well, defining uh, bolts type of bolts the code only talks about high, about high strength bolts so the specification for high strength bolt uh, bolt specifications are are that a325 of stm or a490 of stm okay and with bolts, we can have two types of uh, joints. One is slip critical joint, and another is bearing type joint. Now, this is important. Slip critical joint, where we get the strength through the uh, friction of the two materials when they are clamped together very tightly. And it is very important to have good surface of the uh, base metals to have this slip critical joint. So the surface preparation is very important. And uh, so this, this slip critical joint, we pretension the bolt and tightly clamp the bolts with the uh, metal plates. And from that, just by friction, it is so tightly clamped that the friction between those two plates actually gives us the resistance against any movement. But in bearing type joint, the, the clamping is not that tight. And the surface, we cannot depend on the, the preparation of surface is not that good that we can depend that the friction of the surface will give us the complete resistance. We have to depend on the bolt that is the shear resistance of the bolt and the bearing resistance of the bolt. So we have to depend on the bolt. That's why it's called bearing type joint. Uh, okay, let's talk about them. Uh, then 
for bolting, first we have to drill holes. So what should be the hole size? You see, there are four different types of hole sizes. For different types of bolt diameters, like M16 milli, 20 milli, 22 milli, uh, the stand, standard size is always 2 millimeter more. Di the diameter is always 2 millimeter more than the bolt diameter. That is the standard, usually. For um, bigger bolts, uh, is three, three millimeters more. But uh, sometimes we have to drill more, like oversized holes. Those are four millimeters bigger in diameter than the bolt size. And there are other types like short slot and long slot. That is, they are not circular. They are elongated, uh, oval shaped like a short slot, the first one for M16, uh, we can have 18 millimeter, just like the standard diameter in one direction, and the, uh, in the other direction, that may be 22 millimeter. And so this is like a slot. And that slot can be longer. It can be long, as long as 18 by 40 for the first one, M16. So we see there are different sizes of holes. Now, uh, the code says oversized holes are permitted in any or all plies of slip critical connections, but they shall not be used in bearing type connections. So this is important. That for, in usually, with most of the cases we uh, design bearing type connections. But for special moment frames, uh, we cannot design for bearing type connections. We have to go for slip critical joints. But in, usually we design for bearing type connections. For bearing type connections, we cannot have oversized holes. That's restricted. For slip critical connections, if we have oversized holes, then the washer in the code, there are specifications of washers, standard washers. So I didn't cover those, but there are uh, specifications for standard washers, fasteners, all the uh, accessories, there are specifications. So for oversized holes, we cannot just use standard washer. We need to use hardened washers. Uh, Short slotted holes are permitted in any or all plies of slip critical or bearing type connections. We can use short slotted holes. The slots are permitted without regard to direction of loading in slip critical connections. In slip critical connections, we can place the elongated uh, direction in any direction, elongated um, side in any direction. But for bearing type connections, the length shall be normal to the direction of the loading. As we know, in bearing type connections, we have to depend on the bolt. So in the direction of loading, uh, we depend on the, uh, the that the uh, base plate is in touch with the bolt. If there is gap, then there will be a lot of deformation, right? So if we place the elongated part along the elongated side, along the a direction of loading, then there will be no touch, there will be gap uh, from the weld, from the bolt and the base metal plate. That we cannot allow. So we have to be very, very careful while placing the uh, holes. Uh, we have to consider the direction of loading in case of bearing type connections. Long slotted holes are permitted in only one of the connected parts of either a slip critical or a bearing type connection at an individual fin surface. That is, we can, uh, you see, there will be holes on both the plates, but in only one plate we can have long slotted holes. We cannot have long slotted holes on uh, both the plates. So that's a requirement. Long slot, slotted holes are permitted 
without regard to direction of loading in sleep critical connections, but shall be normal to the direction of loading in bearing type connections. So the same thing is applicable here also for long slotted holes too, that the elongated side must be perpendicular to the direction of loading. So uh, minimum, uh, then we minimum spacing and edge distance, right? So what should be the minimum spacing of well? Uh, sorry, holes, bolts, center to center distance of bolts, and what should be the minimum distance from the edge of the plate? The distance between centers of uh, standard, oversized, and or slotted holes shall not be less than uh, there's some mistake, two times the nominal diameter D of the fastener, a distance, oh, it, it, this is wrong, actually it should have been 2.5 probably, oh sorry, 2 and something is wrong here, 2, th uh, two point something, I don't remember, it probably is 2.5 times the nominal diameter D of the fastener, uh, but 3D is always preferable and usually what we practice is 3D. Now, uh, minimum edge distance is tabulated in this table. So depending on the bolt diameter uh, and what type of edge is uh, edge we, uh, the, uh, the plate has, it depends on that. If the edge is sheared, that if the edge is uh, produced by cutting the plate, then that is a sheared edge. Or if the edge is a rolled edge, that is while manufacturing, uh, during the rolling process, the edge is created. It is not created afterwards by cutting the plate. So depending on the type of the edge, we, we have different minimum edge distance. When the edge is created by cutting a plate, then we have to leave more space between uh, bolt hole and uh, the edge. Okay. So this is very important. For built-up sections, we have to be very careful because built-up sections are usually uh, produced by cutting plates. Now, uh, edge distance increment, that is... Uh, for slotted holes we have, and oversized holes, those, those were, these uh, were for uh, standard holes, these measurements. But for oversized holes and slotted holes, we have to leave more space. Like for oversized holes, 2 milli or 3 milli more distance we have to leave. And for slotted holes, it, it is tabulated here. Uh, the maximum distance from the center of any bowl to rivet to the nearest edge of parts in contact shall be 12 times the thickness, that is the maximum, of the connected part under consideration but shall not exceed 150 millimeters. So if, if we are connecting something, uh, so the distance of that connected part from the edge should not be more than uh, 12 times th the thickness of the connected part. Okay, uh, these are, th this is important when we say attach a uh, bracing with, uh, with a gusset plate. Then in the gusset plate, edge of the, from the edge of the gusset plate, the bracing, what should be the distance we should follow these recommendations. Now pretension or snug tightened high strength bolts. So uh, we have discussed about slip critical joints. So for slip critical joints and even for bearing type of joints, we have to pretension. We have to give tension. We have to give tension in the bolt so that it, it, it is tightly, and the plates are tightly clamped with one another. 
So we can uh, give that pretension uh, with a uh, wrench, like uh, power wrench, so electric type of power wrench, or we can use some um, manual method. When you use a manual method, it is called snug tight. Now, the definition of snug tight is the snug tight condition is defined as the tightness attained by either a few impacts of an impact wrench or the full effort of a worker with an ordinary spud wrench that brings the connected plies into firm contact. Okay, so the worker has to give his full effort, then that will be snug tight. Or we can use the impact wrench. So these are the nominal stress of fasteners that we use to calculate the capacity. So for tension capacity, we use F and T, and to calculate the shear capacity, we use F and V. So different types of, uh, for different types of bolts and uh, whether threads are there uh, at the shear plane, depending on that, uh, the capacity is changed. For example, if we have a, three, a 325 bolt, with threads not excluded from the shear plane. So uh, we have, in the shear plane you have threads, so the effective area is less. In that case, the nominal shear stress uh, is 330 megapascal. But if there is no thread in the shear plane, then that is 414 megapascal, like that, okay? Now let's talk about tension and shear strength of bolts. We have just introduced F and T, F and F and V. We have to multiply with the area of the bolt. So now you can you can say that, but in the bolt there are threads. We should have considered the effective area that is already considered in that table. So we just have to multiply with the uh, area of the bolt. Okay. And now the strength reduction factor and safety factor, resistance factor and the safety factor, they are uh, mentioned here, 0 0.75 and 2. Now, when there is combined tension and shear, so you know when there is tension and if there is tension and then you shear something, the shear capacity becomes very, uh, gets reduced. So when they are simultaneously applied, then the capacity gets reduced. So those equations are given here. So high string bolts in slip critical connections, so the, the nominal strength depends on a number of parameters, mu, du, HSC, TB, and S, number of parameters. So uh, mu, this is very important, this mu. This is, uh, we know that mu stands for uh, friction coefficient. Here is, is actually uh, friction coefficient. It's called mean slip coefficient. It depends on surface. So surfaces are defined for slip critical connections in two classes, class A and class B. Class A is the surface that is perfect, that is, uh, the if the surface is as fresh as it is uh, just manufactured. So if we can prepare a surface or just uh, after manufacturing we uh, put a slip joint, then the surface is class A. And class B surface is uh, not like that, but still there, in the code there are provisions what type of treatments should be there. So class B is not as fresh as just uh, manufactured at the factory. So for them, uh, they, we have different uh, slip coefficient and uh, H, 
HSC uh, DU 1.13. I don't remember right now what is DU is for. Mm. I have to check. I just forgot. HSC is whole factor determined as follows uh, for uh, type of hole, standard or oversized or long slotted or short slotted. HSC stands for that. And uh, okay. TB. TB is bolt tension, tensile strength of bolt. NS is uh, the number of plies, the number of slip surfaces. Okay. I have to check what is DU. So, now bearing tab bolts, I think you are uh, familiar with these. Uh, there can be bearing type failure, that is uh, at the bearing surface, it may yield and there may be tear out type of rupture uh, if it is close to an edge. So from the edge, if the, the for tearing, the effective area is LC, that is the distance from the edge and the thickness. And for bearing type, it is DT, that is uh, the diameter of the hole, and T is the thickness of the plate. So DT is the effective area. So for bearing type of bolts, so we have two criteria at a, a, for each cases. Each case, when deformation at the bolt hold at service load is a design consideration. Uh, at service load, uh, we if we consider that there may be there can be uh, no deformation of the bolt, uh, then. Uh, there are two criteria, you see, one with LC to T that is related to tear out and other is D into T that is related to, so 1.2 LC TFU that is related to uh, tear out and 2.4 D into T into FU that is related to bearing type. So in each case we have these criteria, different types of criteria. When deformation at the bolt hole at service load is not a design consideration, so we, if we allow some uh, deformation at the bolt hole, then we have um, higher limits. Sorry, uh, we have to go for, the second one is that we do not consider, we do not allow, so we have to go for higher capacity, sorry. No, the second one is we we have high limits, so we allow some deformation. And for long slotted holes, we have different equation. So those were uh, some tips, rather I should say some tips about connections. So uh, the tables that are provided in the code, how to uh, conserve those uh, tables, I have just given those tips. So different types of wells and welding processes, based on them you can determine the throat size and then you calculate the capacity. And for bolts, depending on the different types of bolt holes and different types of joints, slip critical or bearing type, how to calculate the capacities. So those these were some tips to uh, for you. Now that was one topic. I am going to talk about the next topic, which is <clears throat> direct analysis method. If you remember, uh, yesterday I showed you one uh, one hierarchy that. Analysis, we can do analysis in two ways, elastic analysis and inelastic analysis. And then I said that in elastic analysis, there can be uh, uh, first order analysis and second order analysis. And in the second order analysis, we can uh, go for effective length method. First order analysis can be also effective length method. And 
uh, another second order analysis direct analysis method so usually our usual practice is to uh, to go for the effective length method having k we have to determine k we have to um, we have to understand what should be the value of k which is effective length factor so our buckling analysis depends entirely on that that what is the effective length but in direct analysis method the method was developed actually to avoid that problem it is sometimes quite tricky to actually judge what should be the effective length factor and it depends the whole analysis depends on that so to avoid that way this direct analysis method was evolved the, the, and that's why probably in this method k is always one effective length factor is always one you can you can wonder that why and then how we deal with buckling let's see so this method is a rational approach to stability analysis and design why is it a rational method we'll discuss second point is p delta p large delta and p small delta effects are accounted for through second order analysis both are accounted for in our effective length method we also account for both of these effects using b1 and b2 factors here we treat it in a different way geometric imperfections accounted for through direct inclusion in analysis model or by applying notional laws now we'll talk about notional laws yesterday we didn't talk about notional laws Loads. what is uh, what is notional load uh, now uh, you can understand this is uh, something related to geometric imperfections so we consider geometric imperfection in direct analysis method by notional loads we'll discuss about that now fourth point is inelastic effects such as distributed plasticity are accounted for using flexural and axial stiffness reduction. This is very important. In this analysis method, we reduce the stiffness, flexural and axial stiffness. So that is one trick of this method. And since we consider all the second order effects, and by that we actually uh, get the uh, buckling capacity we don't need to artificially change the length using a uh, length uh, or effective length factor so k is always one we don't need to worry about k anymore so if we if we compare so uh, the major difference is that in effective length method, uh, nominal EI and EA stiffness values for flexural and uh, axial stiffness uh, values are used. In DA, we reduce them. Notional loads. Originally, in effective lo uh, length method, uh, until 1989, uh, there was no notional concept of notional load in effective length method later in effective length method notional load was introduced we didn't we mentioned about this point zero zero two y i yesterday when we discussed uh, discussed about effective length method but we didn't call it notional load because the code doesn't call it notional load but this is actually kind of notional load because in the lm method this was introduced to uh, to deal with the geometric information in, in to some extent so but in the effective long length method uh, this is prescribed as the minimum lateral load so if the lateral load is more than this value at any level any story level 
then we don't need to add any extra uh, load for geometric imperfection. But in direct integration, uh, direct um, analysis method, this is different. The value is same, 0.002 yi. Yi is the gravity load at some story level, ith level. So the value is same, but, but the uh, but the treatment is different. Like uh, for uh, when there is less second order effect, then uh, this is the minimum. We don't need to add to the existing lateral load, other types of lateral loads. But if the second order effect is uh, bigger, then we have to add this value with the with other types of lateral loads. So then this is additional. This is called notional load. And the K value is always one for direct analysis method. So what happens uh, in the effective length method, uh, uh, the calculation is such that we always uh, kind of uh, overestimate the axial force and we have less amount of moment. So from the left picture, you can understand if the, the difference between actual response and uh, the uh, analysis uh, results. In the left picture, uh, um, this, the interaction curve is shown and the thicker line, that is the analysis result, that intersects at some point, so that is the capacity. So the capacity of, we overestimate the axial capacity and we underestimate the flexural capacity. Okay, uh, so that's the problem. But in direct analysis method, the method is developed in such a way that it, it at the at the uh, ultimate level, when it reaches the capacity, then the actual capacity and the uh, direct analysis method predicted capacity is very similar. So it, it was developed in that way. But for other limit states, like serviceability limit state, then they will be different. In case of elastic uh, um, effective length method, in the other service, uh, other limit states, uh, they are very close to actual response. But in direct analysis method, at the ultimate limit state, this is close to the actual response. But in other limit states, this is not so close. So that's a big difference. So these are the points that we have to remember to apply direct analysis method. We have to model the frame behavior accurately. So this is uh, not so difficult. We are used to modeling using finite element method-based software. So if we model in that fashion, that is okay. That is the accurate model. But if we go for like 2D analysis, uh, a few years ago, many uh, designers of steel structures, they used to uh, uh, model 2D frames. Uh, and then analyze, that is not accurate. That causes problem. Second important issue is that we have to factor the loads. For LRFD, this is not a problem. We always factor uh, with over, uh, over load factors. But for ASD, since the whole method is based on the ultimate limit state, so even for ASD, we have to first multiply uh, the, um, the uh, what do you call it, ASD load combinations with 1.6. And after doing all the calculations, the results, are, then uh, we have to divide the results with 1.6. So. Uh, if we want to follow ASD method, then that's the problem here in direct analysis method. Even the ASD load combinations, we have to factor with 1.6 because at the end, we'll divide the results with 1.6. 
Third important point is that consider initial imperfections. So we can consider initial imperfections in two ways. One is while modeling our frames, we can provide some initial sway, initial drift at different levels. Very small drift. If we, uh, if we want to consider initial imperfection, we can apply some very small amount of drift at different levels. Or without doing that, we can uh, we can model as usual, and then we can apply notional loads, which will reflect the effect of initial geometric imperfections. Third, fourth point is reduce all stiffness that contributes to stability. So there are factors by which in this method in the code the, those factors are given. We reduce the uh, stiffness, EI and EA flexural stiffness and axial stiffness. And then second order analysis is con uh, conducted uh, where both P large delta and P little delta, uh, both type of effects are considered. I'm sure that uh, many of you are quite familiar with uh, software like uh, SAP or ETAPS or STAD and you have inbuilt functions in the, those software uh, that can deal with that. So that's not a problem. And to use direct analysis method, we have to use, to apply direct analysis method, we have to use software. So software will take, in that, uh, take that into account. Now, K is always one, that is not a problem. And the last point is for serviceability checks, we have to use unreduced stiffness. So we have to run, we have to run actually the, we have to run our models many times. I'll explain why we have to do that. And for serviceability checks, we, we cannot reduce the stiffnesses. So stiffness, unreduced, for unreduced stiffness values will run and check the serviceability limit checks. So these are some important points that we have to remember while uh, applying direct analysis method. So the model has to be accurate. What do you mean by that? So you can see this is nothing but the usual finite element modeling which many of us used to. And the advantage of this is that for a certain direction, some La there are uh, columns that will contribute in resisting the lateral load. But in, uh, fr from other grids, there will be columns which will be what is called leaning column, which will not contribute, which may not contribute to the lateral load, but they have to undergo the same amount of deformation with the whole uh, structure. And those columns, since those, those columns are gravity load bearing columns, they will have gravity loads on them and then they will go uh, undergo deformation, so side sway, that will cause P delta F A and that will contribute to the second order moments. So that's why if we model the frame in three dimensionally, then we can get that picture. Otherwise we do not get that picture. Two-dimensional models are not good for uh, direct analysis method. So I, I think this is not a problem for us. Very few people use two-dimensional models anymore. Now, factoring loads. For ASD, as I have already said, we have to factor the ASD load combination uh, with 1.6. For LRFD, we can use normal LRFD, LRFD load combinations, strength design load combinations. And But very important thing that is that in elastic analysis, what the software does is that uh, it analyzes the structure for dead load, it analyzes the structure for live load, it analyzes the structure for wind load, earthquake load, and then, after the analy all these analyses, 
and they're combined. The results are superposed. But that superposition is not valid for direct, since we will consider P delta effects, both types of P delta effects, that kind of superposition is no more valid. So we have to combine all these combinations. Uh, like we cannot have run for separately for dead load and run separately for lateral loads. We cannot do that. We have to combine them and that will be one run, uh, case for running. Because all the loads, both lateral load and gravity load must be present to take P delta effect into account. So that's that's very important. And now how we can consider initial imperfections, geometric imperfections into account. There can be two types of geometric imperfection. One is one is uh, the out of straightness of members. It, that is somewhat taken into account by uh, reduction of stiffness. And another is out of plumbness, that is, uh, it is no more completely vertical. There may be from one story level to another story level, there may be a little bit of out of plumbness. And that we can consider in two ways, the out of plumbness. While modeling, we can, we can model it in that way, that the uh, levels are not uh, vertically uh, upright. There may be some out of plumbness. That's one way. Another is to uh, consider by reducing the uh, stiffness. Oh. oh, sorry. Another one is by uh, applying notional loads. Now, what are the notion loads? Notion loads are these, these loads. They are lateral loads. And this is very small amount, only 0.2% of the vertical load, gravity load. So at each level, say level YJ, the lateral load at that level will be 0.002 YJ and like that. So, and these notion loads are actually uh, to account for geometric imperfection and other types of non-ideal conditions. Lateral loads applied at each framing level, specified, uh, specified in terms of gravity loads at that level, at that level. Applied in direction that adds to destabilizing effects, so we have to independ independently apply in x direction and then in y direction, in both the directions, independently need not be applied if structure is modeled in an assumed out of plumb state. So if we model the structure as out of plumb, in the out of plumb state, then we don't need to apply them. But usually we don't model out of plumbness, we apply these notional loads. So how to apply the notional loads? Consider initial, these notional loads are uh, actually for, uh, to consider initial geometric imperfection. And the notional loads uh, can be applied as loads or notional displacement, usually we apply for as nodes, loads, notional loads. Here you see the factor, for LRFD the factor is 1 and for ASD the factor is 1.6. And the last thing is very important. Uh, if, if the second order sway divided by the first order sway, sway ratio is less than 1.7 for reduced stiffness or for nominal stiffness without reduction of stiffness, if it is less than 1.5, then uh, then if at a particular story level the existing lateral load for other sources is more than 0.002y then we don't need to add this we, this is the minimum lateral load condition 
if the second order effect is not that much. If these sway ratios are more than these limiting values, then we have to add these notional loads with other lateral loads. So if we have wind load, earthquake load, whatever lateral load, we have to add this 0 0.002 yi if the sorry uh, uh, sway ratio is more than these limited values. So that is very important. Now, uh, why do we reduce the uh, stiffness? One reason is to is to consider the residual stresses. Usually the steel sections, the way they are produced, depending on how they are produced, they have some amount of residual stresses. To consider those residual stresses, we reduce the stiffness value, stiffness reduction. Now, uh, how much do you have to reduce the stiffness? Uh, EA, that is axial stiffness, we take 80%. And EI, EI depends on the on the uh, axial force, axial force that, that is coming onto the structure. If the axial force is much less than the axial capacity, then we just reduce 80%. If the axial uh, force is more than that, then the, there are some formulas that we have to calculate. So that is important. And remember, during uh, the process of uh, deforming, deformation, uh, the, the axial force, is, these values vary. And usually the software in every increment of deformation, it calculates the amount of axial force that's coming onto a particular member. And incrementally, the stiffness, a flexural stiffness is adjusted. Okay. So that is it. Uh, we can do another thing. We can always consider tau b as 1. Uh, if we, instead of applying notional load as 0.002, yi if we apply 0 0.003 yi then tau b is always one that we can do this one is important this was in, important uh, to consider the p little delta effect to accurately uh, accurately for accurate analysis of p-delta effect, we have to mesh the columns. This is interesting. Usually, the beam column elements that we, that are there in the software, in any software like PTAP, SAP, STAB, whatever, the beam column elements are perfect, are exact. That is, we don't, to get exact uh, solutions, we don't need to mesh beam column elements. So that's why usually we don't uh, mesh beams or columns. We mesh slabs or we mesh walls, but usually you don't mesh uh, beam columns. But to get the P delta effect, P little delta effect, we have to mesh the columns. We don't need to mesh the beams. We have to mesh the columns. So this is important. So it depends uh, how how uh, fine meshes you want to use, but uh, like at least there should be four divisions in in each column in each story level. So uh, okay. Uh, this is important. Reduction factors like EA and EI, uh, after, after the design, like initially we don't have the design, right? So we design 
and we go for first actually elastic um, uh, analysis and then we finish our design and then we check with the, this uh, direct analysis method and after the design we get all the axial loads and from those axial loads we can uh, accurately uh, determine what amount of reduction uh, of stiffness should be there then we uh, applies those those uh, reductions of stiffness stiffness values and then we run again and when we run again for different load combinations remember we run for load combination not only for dead load or only for lateral load we run for combinations so for different load combinations when we run so that may change your design so when it changes your design you have to iterate this process again because every time there may be changing this uh, sway ratio to second order sway by first order sway ratio and this one i have mentioned probably already that if the sway ratio for reduced stiffness case is less than 1.7 or for nominal stiffness case if it is less than 1.5 then the uh, notion lowers are minimum lateral loads they are not additive to the uh, other lateral loads otherwise we have to add them and, uh, so we have to actually we have to check this for each and every load case so for some load case load case like uh, dead load wind load and then notion loads or dead load earthquake load and notion loads so uh, for each of these load case uh, case the scenario may be different but what we can simply do is that we to be conservative we can add this notional load to all the cases so that will make our life easier so this is the summary uh, I, I think i have already said all of these uh, like direct analysis method k is always one but in effective leg method, we have to go for uh, stability analysis to determine the value of K. Uh, direct analysis method, we actually analyze the structure for P delta, P large delta and P little delta effects. And in, in effective length method, we calculate some factors to consider p delta effects uh, b1 and b2 factors and we apply them so that's kind of approximate way indirect way of uh, of considering these effects in effective length method geometric imperfection is not considered uh, there is a uh, there is a um, provision for notional load but that is minimal and for when actually effective length method is not valid first order if, uh, no second order effective length method is not valid when sway ratio is more than 1.5 for unreduced stiffness values if it is more than 1.5 then effective length method is no more valid no more allowed you have to go for direct analysis method uh, loss of stiffness under high compression loads are considered during analysis uh, and uh, by all these provisions in direct analysis method the net effect is that it amplifies second order forces and the results are very close to actual response This is very important that serviceability checks should be uh, while uh, checking the serviceability limits 
we cannot reduce the stiffness values. So we have to use unreduced stiffness. So what are the serviceability limit checks? So drift limits for wind and seis seismic cases. And uh, if we want to calculate the building period, then we cannot reduce the stiffness. And for check of uh, checking of vibration, then we have to use unreduced stiffness. So that was about all about direct analysis method. In some of the softwares, uh, the, the direct analysis method is already incorporated, like SAP. You can find direct analysis method is there. And I, I think there are uh, user manuals, there are some manuals where you can learn how to use SAP to, uh, to apply direct analysis method. So uh, when we have large second order effects, we have to go for the direct analysis method. And this understanding is very important. <clears throat> now, so that was the second topic. Let's talk about seismic provisions. Let me first admit that I cannot I cannot cover all the aspects of seismic provisions uh, comprehensively in this talk because uh, it will require a long time to cover all the different topics because this is so, so uh, complicated in a sense that is rather more complicated than the seismic provisions for reinforced concrete because there are different types of systems in uh, steel structures. They are mentioned here, moment frames, special truss moment frames, concentrically braced frames, eccentrically braced frames, buckling restrained braced frames, and spatial plate shear walls. And the behavior under seismic load and the desired response under seismic load are so different uh, in these systems from one another, completely different, which is not the case for uh, reinforced concrete uh, systems. That's one reinforced concrete system mostly frames or dual systems, and the, the variations are limited. So it's rather easier to talk about reinforced concrete seismic provisions than uh, steel, for steel structures, and it's quite complicated. So uh, another thing is that I'm not talk about the loading part. The loading part has already been covered, so I'll go straight to the design part. Let's see some pictures of different types of uh, systems. So moment frames at the top left, in the top middle, you have a spatial truss frame. Uh, and the top right is concentric braced frame. Uh, left bottom is eccentric braced frame. There may be, there can be many different configurations, both for uh, CBF and EBF, concentric braced frame and eccentric brace frame, there are many different uh, variations in configurations. And uh, bottom middle is the uh, buckling resisting and bracing system and uh, special plate shear wall is at the bottom right. So these are different uh, systems and I repeat, for example, the behavior of concentrically braced frame and eccentrically braced frame clothing. I will concentrate more on moment frames uh, in this talk. But to begin with, what are the different mechanisms? What we actually, uh, the desired mechanisms? For example, in the moment frames, in the ultimate load condition, 
for extreme event of size, extreme seismic event what we want how we want the structure to behave to respond for moment frames do you want hinges to form uh, to form in the columns we want the hinges to form in the beams that's that's similar like uh, uh, reinforced concrete we want strong columns weak beams we want the hinges to be formed in the beams so that the energy dissipates there uh, so that it can still carry the gravity load in case of concentrically based frame the understanding is a bit different the understanding is that we want to have some structural fuse through which uh, the energy will be dissipated while it will retain the uh, vertical load the carrying capacity in that case we want the bracings to act like fuses so we want the bracings to buckle and yield so that uh, the energy is dissipated through the bracings while the other members of the structure they remain elastic so this is very important usually what we understand that uh, under extreme seismic event extreme seismic loading we have inelasticity in the structure that's why we reduce the load by using uh, response reduction factor r but remember we want in elasticity in certain members not in all members even at the extreme uh, event we want certain members to behave elastically while we want some other members to behave inelastically so this understanding is very important in case of eccentrically braced frame the middle part of the beam we want that to act like a fuse so we want energy dissipation from there now when we want energy dissipation we want to make sure that we want to induce that type of uh, internal forces in the fuse which actually dissipates energy so for example we don't want it to fail in a brittle manner we want it to fail in a ductile manner while it it yields it uh, dissipates energy but it doesn't fail in a brittle manner so that's very tricky. We have to ensure that it doesn't fail in a brittle manner, but all the, most of the energy is dissipated through the fuse. The fuse, the fuse will not have a brittle failure. It will have a ductile nature. At the same time, all other members will, be, will remain elastic. So that is the philosophy for uh, seismic design for steel structures here is an example this is called uh, rbs moment connection what is uh, interesting uh, i hope you can follow you can you can see what is interesting here please notice carefully that there is no local buckling the curved lines you are seeing those are not local bucklings. Those are actually the beam sections are reduced in those places. These are the place where we want the hinge to form. So this is intentionally the beam section is reduced. So this is called reduced beam section, RBS moment connection. So this is a special moment connection where we have very strong panel zone that is beam column uh, joined in that the in the connect, connecting part that is panel zone we don't want there any kind of uh, buckling in the panel zone and we don't want any kind of kink formation uh, between the panel zone and columns 
So that's why we want a protective zone uh, on two sides of the column in the beam so that the hinge is not formed very close to the column. So that is, there we want to have a protective distance uh, to where the hinges can form. So that's why we intentionally reduce the flange diameter, flange width uh, in those locations. So this is called RBS moment connection. Okay. Now, this is very important. We know about compact section. We know that width thickness ratios, that is slenderness ratios that, uh, of the elements of a member, uh, if those ratios are less than lambda p, then we call them compact sections. So we want compact sections in some places. And there is another terminology that is seismically compact section. Not only lambda p, we want to be more conservative. We want to have another uh, width thickness ratio, more conservative width thickness ratio is called lambda ps, so lambda p seismic, lambda ps. We want width thickness ratio to be less than this lambda ps to ensure that those seismically compact section will definitely yield. We don't even allow inelastic buckling in those, uh, they, we want to be more conservative. So those are lambda ps, seismically compact. Oops. So the values of lambda ps are given uh, in this chapter, uh, in this seismically, this is section 1020. Right, chapter 10 and section 20, 10, 20. There the, this table is given. The table number is 6, 10, 18. Uh, the limiting width thickness ratio for seismically compact sections. So I'm showing only the unstiffened elements. Uh, for stiffened elements, and there, uh, there are other values for stiffened elements in the table. Now uh, I'm introducing uh, some concepts. So I've talked about uh, compact sections, seismically compact sections. Um, so in the code it is written for which type of system in which member we want the member to be seismically compact. So when we, in the code, certain member is, is mentioned that this member should be seismically compact, we have to check those limits. Now I'll introduce another concept, but this is, uh, I think you are familiar to this, over strength factor. Now, the R values, I think you already know how we come up with these R values. So uh, the R values, actually there are two parts. One is R mu, that is uh, ductility factor, and another is omega naught, which is overstrength factor. Why? The concept is uh, if our structure would have been completely elastic, then under the application, uh, under, um, under some seismic event, the base shear that would come onto the structure is suppose is VE. Say our structure follows the dotted line which ends at E. If the structure were completely elastic, in that case uh, the behavior would have been linear, then the structure would collapse at the point E and the base shear that it would sustain would have been VE. But we know that we cannot design like that. We cannot design our structures as elastic. So we allow inelasticity. So if our structure would show a bilinear behavior, that is elastic, perfectly plastic behavior, 
then we, we could get the blue dashed line. In that case, the energy that uh, our structure will, the, our structure could sustain the amount of energy, uh, the same amount of energy it could sustain like the elastic case in reduced load in V if the base shear were Vy and if our structure could undergo deformation up to delta M, so possibly the same amount of energy it would sustain. So that is the com concept of inelastic design. But in real case what happens, the structure doesn't behave bilinearly. The structure behaves non-linearly like the solid blue uh, curve. The structure remains elastic up to only point S. So what we do? We design the structure for Vs. The base shear is Vs. We design, we, we assume the structure has the capacity only up to S. So we become conservative. So this part from point S to point Y, this is kind of reserved strength. But we have to understand one thing. This is not only reserve strength. This is the actual case. So in reality, although we design our structure for base shear Vs and we become conservative to think that the capacity is S up to uh, Vs, that is the capacity. And at the same time, we assume a deformation like delta M, but, but actually what happens during the earthquake, the load actually comes. The load comes up to Vy. So as I said, we want some portion of our structure to take, to go through this deformation. It takes all, most of the energies, energy, and the rest of the rest of the structure remains elastic. So what happens, the portion that shows elastic ductility, that also has to go for higher level of force. So on, on those portions of the structure, actually they have to sustain V up to Vy. If, that, if we design in such a way that uh, the uh, structural fuse components, they cannot sustain Vy, how will they experience a deformation up to delta M? So the structural fuse items, those items which we want them to undergo a large deformation, at the same time we have to make sure they don't collapse early. So we have to make sure they have enough strength so that they, they can sustain the load up to Vy. So we have to ensure both. So you see, we have to ensure the strength, but at the same time, we cannot make it too stiff. We want to have, uh, we do want to make it ductile and flexible. So two different things. We want the structural fuses to be ductile and flexible. And at the same time, we want them to uh, uh, to sustain at least the force level up to Vy. That's why the portions that works like structural fuse, we design them not for the uh, for Vs, not for the base shear, regular base shear. We design them for Vy. We multiply that with omega naught over strength factor. So this is very important. That's why we have this overstrength factor in seismic provisions. We have to, for certain components, uh, to design certain components, we have to amplify the force. This is called amplified seismic load. Okay. So uh, think it in this way. But there are certain components which we have to design for this phase three 
and there are other components which will be designed for phase two. Okay, so the, the portions that we design for phase two, we ensure that they have enough stiffness. The portion we design for phase three, we ensure they have enough ductility and flexibility, but they have enough strength as well up to VY. So that is very important. So in AISC, in the in these uh, seismic provisions, this is the basic philosophy. That's why there are so many different types of provisions because the, there are so many detailing that are related to these to make to how we can make uh, the structural fuses ductile and what the connections with the other parts should be. So these are very important things. So this is the amplified uh, seismic load. We have to the horizontal portion of the earthquake load E, not the vertical part, not EH, the horizontal part. E shall be multiplied by the system over strength factor omega naught. Now where can we find omega naught in the uh, loading chapter that is in chapter 2 part 6 uh, the same table where we find the response reduction factor R in the same table we have for different building types we have this over system over strength factor omega naught so we can use from this table if uh, still still systems are so versatile that we may even get some new system uh, for which uh, the, the, there is no value mentioned in the table. So for new types of steel syst structural systems, uh, if we don't have any reference, then we can by default take omega naught as 2. You see for uh, billing frame system, for brace frames, eccentrically or concentrically brace frames, omega naught is always 2. For moment frames, omega naught is 3. So we have to increase to 3 times seismically, amplified seismically. Now, this one is also important. This is required uh, for connections. So, so we are applying uh, load. We are applying uh, amplified load on these systems. And we have to understand that we have reserve strength. So FY, the capacity, actually, uh, material strength that we define, uh, while defining FY, we actually become very conservative. FY is a conservative estimate of material strength. Uh, now, we know that materials have reserve strength. So we, that reserve strength is reflected here. This is called expected strength. So expected strength will multiply with some factor more than one with Fy and Fu to calculate expected strength. So for some components where we apply size amplified seismic load, at the same time we take into account the uh, the uh, what do you, what is it called? But the capacity, it has reserved capacity. Okay. okay. So now we talk about a little bit about different seismic provisions. So these provisions are applicable for any kind of frames, uh, OMF, IMF, SMS. So like bolter joints, all bolts shall be pre-tensioned high strength bolts and shall meet the requirements for sleep critical fame surfaces with a class A surface. Remember that uh, there are two types of bolter joints. One is sleep critical type, another is bearing type. But for seismic provisions, we have to use sleep critical type where the surface quality should be class A. Okay, we cannot use uh, bearing type connections. The nominal bearing strength at bolt holes shall not be taken greater than 
2.4 dt if fu. So this is the limiting value. Welder joins all welds used in members and connections shall be made with the filler metal that can produce welds that have a minimum Chirpy V notch toughness of 27 joule at 18 degrees centigrade. So we're talking about some tests. So uh, the metal, uh, the filler metal, the welding metal, weld metal, that has to be tested. And uh, if we have a manufacturer certificate, that is okay. But if we want, to, if it is uh, not, it doesn't carry any certificate, then we have to go for this Charpy V notch toughness test. Um, I I think uh, many of you have uh, have experience of this testing in the SM lab. We do this testing in our second year in level two. So, and I think I should mention about another thing which I possibly didn't include in these slides. It's pre-qualified connections. Uh, the seismic provision mentions about pre-qualified connections. That is, we can connect beams and columns in many different ways. But some of the details are already pre-qualified. They are tested. So there are manuals for these types of pre-qualified connections. Uh, AIC has a publication. Most probably Appendix N of AISC, uh, of AISC 360. And there may be another publication of AISC where all the pre-qualified connections are shown. Uh, so we can use those pre-qualified connections. If we don't uh, use those pre-qualified connections, if we have, if we want to use some other type of connections, then we have to go for all these tests and justify the use of those connections, then they will be considered as pre-qualified. So column strength, uh, column strength depend on the uh, actual vertical force that is coming onto it, gravity load by capacity. So here uh, load combination will include amplified for column. For column, we have to always take amplified size, seismic load. The required axial compressive and tensile strength shall not exceed either any of these two, axial compressive and tensile strength. The maximum load transferred to the column, considering 1.1 Ry, or this another value, times the nominal strength of the connecting beam or brace element. So, uh, um, here we are talking about the strength of beam and brace. So we want the hinge to form in the beam or the brace, not in the column. So uh, maximum load transfer to the column from the beam should be restricted to these values. The limit as determined from the resistance of the foundation to overturning uplift. And the, the applied load must be uh, such that the overturning doesn't occur. Okay. So these are basic things. Now column splices. Welded columns, this is very important. Welded column splices, that is, we don't want uh, columns to fail. So we are very conservative about that. Welded column splices that are subject to a calculated net tensile load effect determined using the load combinations, including the amplified seismic load shall satisfy satisfy both the following requirements. So splices. We want to add two column sections together to make a column here splicing. So to, to calculate the capacity of the splice, we have to consider amplified seismic load. And the conditions are one, the available strength of partial joint penetration groove welded joints, if used, shall be at least equal to 200% of the required strength. 
So from the calculation of the loads, the amount of load that is coming onto that section, the capacity of the PJP joint should be twice of that when we are taking amplified seismic load. So we are that conservative about columns. Okay. We don't want uh, to hinges to form in the column. That's why you are so conservative. The available strength of each flange splice shall be at least equal to half of RYFYAF, that is flange area multiplied by yield strength multiplied by uh, expected strength factor. The clear height. So in the mid height. The required shear strength of column splice. as appropriate, where MPC is the least nominal plastic pleasure strength, lesser nominal plastic pleasure strength. So in both directions, uh, in weak axis and uh, strong axis, we get two plastic moment capacity. So this is the lesser one, so weaker, and on the weaker axis. So the, we have to calculate the force considering that the plastic moment capacity will reach in the columns. Then we'll get this force. We'll design the splice for that force. So that is the concept. Even for uh, columns that do not participate in seismic resisting, lateral load resisting system, SL, SLRS. For them, these are the conditions. There are other conditions. There are many more conditions. I'm just selectively picking some to describe. So for uh, SMF, special moment frames, there are some conditions for beam to column connections. What are these conditions? Beam to column connection, uh, uh, I'll show some pictures of beam to column connections step by step, how they're uh, in the field at the site, how we prepare a connection. Beam to column connection used in the seismic load resisting system, SLRS, shall satisfy the following three requirements. The connection shall be capable of sustaining an interior drift angle of at least 0 0.404 radian. So, We don't want any kind of brittle failure. So if there are some imperfections, like something sticking to that uh, uh, joint, uh, that, that region, some tack weld, uh, some, uh, something sticking to it, some ejection aid, that may cause some extra stresses. And that may cause a uh, brittle type of failure. Like uh, something may punch through the well, web. So we don't want that to happen. So you have to be very careful. Welded shear studs and decking attachments that penetrate the beam flange shall not be placed on beam flanges within the protected zone. Decking arc spot welds as required to secure decking shall be permitted. So, so uh, any kind of extra stress uh, that can come from other attachments we should avoid in the protected zone. Welded, bolted, screwed, or shorting attachments for premier, perimeter edge angles, exterior facades, partitions, ductwork, piping, or others shall not be placed within the protected zone. So, same thing. So, we have to be very careful about the protected zone. So, once we make the connection, uh, we, we finish the construction of the connection, then we have to remove all the different types of attachments. So here you see the protected zone is in the beam and it is supposed to buckle. It is supposed to not, it is supposed to yield, that is hinge 
is supposed to form there. But while hinge formation in the beam, that's why this is RBS, like you see, reduced beam section. While hinges form in the beam section, at that time there is a tendency that is the panel zone, that is just the uh, beam column junction, the panel zone you can see between the stiffeners, there is a tendency of buckling in the panel zone. So we have to be, we have to design in such a way that, that this type of buckling is avoided. So we have to be, uh, we have to design, we have to have some requirements for that. And the code provides those requirements for panel zones. Uh, panel zone of beam to column connections. As a minimum, the required shear strength of the panel zone shall be determined from the summation of the moments at the column faces as determined by projecting the expected moments at the plastic hinge points to the column faces. The design shear strength shall be and uh, the allowable shear strength be. So uh, uh, that's it. And the nominal strength are V and according to that. So what uh, what is important here that that we have to take the moments while designing panel zone, it is not sufficient to take the moments of the beam end moments. That comes from loading. No. We have to consider the total plastic moment capacity of the beam. That is, we will while designing panel zone, we will apply the plastic moment capacity of beam section as load on the panel zone. We'll assume that the beams will form plastic hinges, so there will be plastic moment acting on the beam uh, on the beam end, and we'll apply that on the panel zone to design the panel zone. Okay, just we, we cannot use the beam end moments that we can get from the analysis from our models. So that is that is the moment that comes from the loads applied loads. So we, and we want to be very conservative that the beam end moments uh, are much lower than the plastic capacity. So we design in that way. But for extreme events, we'll assume that the hinges will form at the beam end. So that plastic moment will come as load onto the panel zone. So you have to design the panel zone in that way. The individual thickness is T of column webs and doubler plates, if used, shall conform to the following requirements. So we, again, we provide quite, uh, uh, we, we provide thick webs so that in the panel zone, uh, we don't get buckling due to the hinge formation at the beam end. So some details can be shown here. That's why we determine the web thickness in that way and not only we, we use double plates, extra plate with the column web is shown here that is called doubler plate, extra plate uh, we attach with the column web and the panel zone and as stiffener we use continuity plate. So the continuity plates are at the same level of beam flanges. So they, they are called continuity plates. They are stiffeners basically. And we use doubler plate. So doubler plates shall be welded. Oops, sorry. Doubler plates shall be welded to the column flanges using either a complete joint penetration groove weld or fillet welded joint that develops the available shear strength of the full doubler plate thickness. So usually we go for a CJP, complete joint uh, penetration groove weld for doubler plate or fillet weld for the whole thickness. So uh, doubler plate and continuity plates are shown here again. Now, for the design of panel zone, the capacity, what capacity should we consider? 
So that is shown here. And the capacities are dictated by shear, shear buckling. So that's why you can see all the 0.6 FY. And you see that R is not considered here. We are not considering R FY, that is we are not considering any reserved uh, capacity because we want to be conservative for the panel zone. Okay, so we omit the R, we have the FY and we have uh, other terms, uh, area terms for shear capacity. And, and one thing we, uh, for high axial force, we deduct, again we deduct some values, you see, PR by PC, we deduct the capacity with these values. Why? Because these terms come from column shear force. When there is high axial force, uh, column shear forces will reduce the capacity of panel zone. Okay, the column shear forces will come from uh, beam axial forces, right? So the, there will be, for lateral load, there will be shear forces at the end of the columns. And those shear forces will reduce the capacity of the panel zone. So for high axial force, we consider and we reduce those terms from the capacity. Okay. Then column beam moment ratio. This is simple. This is similar as uh, reinforced concrete. In reinforced concrete, this value is 1.2. Here is 1.0. That is uh, column, column moment capacity, plastic moment capacity must be at at least the same as uh, beam plastic moment capacity. So it's defined here, uh, M star PC, the sum of the moments in the column above and below the joint at the intersection of the beam and column center lines. And M star PC is determined by summing up the projections of the nominal flexural strengths of the columns, including haunches, where do you use? above and below the joint to the beam center line with a reduction of the axial force in the column. So uh, it is permitted to take, uh, okay, the formulas are given. So here again, you see, uh, while considering the capacity of columns, we are not considering the reserve strength. But when we have to consider uh, the connections, say, the panel zone, those critical elements, we have we des will design considering the reserve strength of column, considering the reserve strength of beam. So that comes rather like loads. You may think that we use R to enhance the capacity. Actually, that is not the case. Uh, to uh, to overestimate the capacity, that is not the case. When we actually calculate the capacity, we don't use those R's, reserve strength factors. But when we calculate some uh, the capacities of the attachments, like connections, panel zones, then we consider the beam or the column to have not only MP, plastic moment capacity, but multiplied by the reserve strength. Then we consider the reserve strength and we design the connections and the panel zones accordingly. Okay, lateral uh, bracing at beam to column connections, brace connections. So this is, uh, still we are uh, talking about moment frames. We are not talking about concentric brace frame or eccentric brace frame. The conditions are completely different in the, in, for those cases. Those are billing frame system. Brace connections, column flanges at beam to column connections require lateral bracing only at the level of the top flanges of the beams when the webs of the beams and columns are coplanar and the column is shown to remain elastic outside the panel zone. So we need to actually have, uh, theoretically, the top flange will be under compression that's why there is a chance of buckling. So we'll, we have to connect the uh, bearing, uh, bracing with the 
we need a separate bracing for top uh, top flange unbraced connections uh, then we'll call that in the connections where we'll provide bracing uh, for the top flange we'll call that braced connection uh, where we'll not use that that we'll call we'll call that unbraced connections a column containing a beam to column connection with no lateral bracing transverse to the seismic frame at the connection shall be designed using the distance between adjacent lateral braces as the column height for buckling transverse to the seismic frame and shall conform to other conditions in there. So for uh, designing uh, for seismic loading condition and for buckling, what should be the length that we cons should, we should consider as uh, length of the column? From, uh, from the point where there is lateral base to the uh, another point where there is lateral base. From the point of lateral bases, we'll consider the length of the column. So that is the condition. The required column strength shall be determined from the appropriate load combination combinations except that E shall be taken as the lesser of the amplified seismic load or 125% of the frame available strength based upon either the beam available fragile strength or panel zone available shear strength. This is interesting. We'll design column not for only seismic load E. We have to amplify it. By how much? By omega naught, over strength factor. For moment frame systems, moment frames, omega naught is 3. We have to amplify seismic load 3 times. Or what we can do, we can calculate the beam capacity and we have can multiply the beam capacity the beam must uh, be capable of uh, resisting the seismic forces and then the capacity that the beam needs the plastic moment capacity that will provide at the beam level we have to increase that to 125 percent and then we want that at least that amount of capacity in the column or the panel zone shear strength capacity so the columns in other words column capacity must be at least 125 percent of panel zone shear capacity or the beam capacity will design in that way if we design like with amplified seismic load uh, uh, then uh, the capacities must conform to this this limit this one okay and another important point for columns uh, the slenderness ratio shall not exceed only 60 remember uh, yesterday we talked about L by R ratio 300 for tension members 150 for compression members but since this is uh, compression and flexure, combined flexure and compression, L by R ratio must be less than 60. Okay, lateral bracing for beam of beams. Both flanges of beam, for beams, both flanges of beams shall be laterally braced with a maximum spacing of LB, bracing, beam brace, uh, beam bracing spacing. The point zero eight six R Y E by F Y. Now, what is R Y? Oh, radius of gyration in weak axis, uh, about weak axis. So, this comes from actually, uh, this is related to L by R ratio uh, from buckling consideration. We know that uh, all its critical buckling formula we know. From there it comes. So that's why it is related to radius of gyration E and Fy. And there is a factor. Lateral braces shall be placed near concentrated forces, changes in cross-section and other locations where analysis indicates 
that a plastic hinge will form during inelastic deformations of the SMF. So usually we do that, we provide lateral bases near concentrated forces or when there is any abrupt change in cross-section. The required strength of lateral bracing provided adjacent to plastic hinges shall be PU equals 0.06 mu by H naught or PA equals uh, for ASD and LRFT different. Anyway, for LRFT thing, that is the ultimate moment, ultimate load condition, the moment that will come onto it, divided by H, we get the uh, force, AGL force. Uh, so that force, six percent of that force, will we we want the lateral braces to withstand six percent of that force, the force that will come on the structure for ultimate loading on on the beam as moment, where H naught is the distance between flange centroids. So that is a little bit more than the web height. So those were some provisions related to SMF. There are many more. I just skipped many of those provisions. I just uh, selective, selected some provisions to discuss today. But this is very, very, this is not comprehensive at all. And there are so many other issues like uh, modeling issues, like um, analysis issues, how to consider loads, uh, I mean, what forces should be considered to design a particular component. There are many, many different issues out there. So uh, the uh, seismic analysis of steel, say, moment frames, only this topic, it requires multiple of sessions. So I'm skipping many things. Please for, pardon me for that. Uh, I tried to cover some important issues. That's it. For intermediate moment frames, still there are many different issues are there, but I have picked some of them. So beam to column connections similar to SMF. This is wrong, not SMR, similar to SMF, except that required interstory drift angle shall be a minimum of 0 0.02 radian. Remember? While designing beam to column connections for SMF, we have to consider a rotation of 0 0.04 radian. In case of intermediate moment frame, that is less, that is 0 0.02 radian. We have to consider the protected zone similar to SMF. We have to consider beam column limitations similar to SMF. Uh, Beam flanges, abrupt changes in beam flange area are not permitted in plastic hinge regions. Continuity plates shall be provided, but doublet plates may not be provided. Recently in AISC 2016, continuity plates are optional, even for SMF. Uh, so th th there is a big change in the code recently in AISC, but in our code, continuity plates should be provided. Uh, for SMF and for IMF. Uh, lateral bracing of beams, both flanges shall be laterally braced directly or indirectly. The unbraced length between lateral braces shall not exceed. Uh, in, in the previous case, it was like 0 0.086 probably, and this is 0.17, almost double of that. Uh, in addition, lateral braces shall be placed near concentrated loads, etc., etc. This is similar to SMF. Okay, column splices, the conditions are similar to SMF. So, but there are some, some provisions missing in IMF, like provisions related to panel zone. Uh, in case of SMF, panel zone design is quite rigorous, uh, but in IMF, we don't need to be that rigorous about panel zones that's related to IMF, OMF. Beam to column connections. Beam to column connections shall be made with wells or high strength bolts, connection. These are the seismic provisions of OMF. Remember, there are systems where we don't need to follow these provisions either. 
we can design without following these provisions. In that case, we have to consider R3. But if we take these provisions into account and design OMF, then the value of R will be like 3.5, something more than 3. So that's the difference. Beam to column connections shall be made with wells or high strength bores. Connections are permitted to be fully restrained or partially restrained. So even for seismic case, partial moment connections are allowed for OMF. Wells, complete joint penetration groove wells of beam flanges, shear plates, and beam webs to columns shall be demand critical wells. Now, demand critical wells, like uh, these are, it's written here. They shall be made with a filler metal capable of providing a minimum chirpy V-notch toughness of 27 joule at 29 degrees centigrade. A little bit different. Previously, we talked about 27 joule at 18 degrees centigrade. It's, it's, it's 27 joule at 29 degrees centigrade. So this type of wells, when uh, we provide filler material of this toughness that is called demand critical wells. Okay. Now, continuity plates, when FR moment connections are made by means of wells of beam flanges or beam flange connection plates directed to column flanges, continuity plates shall be provided. In BNBC 2020, that is which follows actually AISC 36005, their continuity plates were, were requirement, were a requirement even for OMF. When when flanges, beam flanges are welded to the column flanges. Okay. So this is all about, uh, I skipped many things. I again admit I skipped many things. I just uh, selected some points. So these are related to OMF. Now I want to finish my talk with these pictures. These are step by step. Uh, uh, construction steps, welding steps, basically welding steps, how beam flange should be welded to the column flange for uh, CJP weld, complete joint penetration in a special moment frame. So suppose we start with the top left uh, picture, there we have the beam, but this is not the complete joint. We, uh, the joint is not complete yet. The welding has to be done. The uh, beam is connected to the column flange through bolted joint. Okay. So uh, through bolted joint and the plate, this gusset plate is welded to the column flange. Usually this plate, uh, the column comes with these plates jointed from the factory by submarine arc welding probably. Uh, they come from the factory like this with these plates uh, with the bolt holes and the beams are connected to the columns um, and uh, then bolted at sight like this. And you can see there is some uh, holes near uh, at the weld uh, at the web level and near the flanges. These holes are called weld access holes. So because we have to weld the flanges, we need some holes so that the uh, welding electrode sticks can enter. So these are called weld access holes, and there are many, many requirements for that, for them, for seismic provisions, how the access holes should be, what should be the shape, what should be the dimension, these are all there in the code. So please follow them, I didn't cover them. So these are the standard access, uh, weld access holes, you can see. So now in the second picture at the top, you see at the bottom, for bottom flange welding, some backing has been provided so that some backing, some uh, metal steel is 
placed under the flange, bottom flange, and tug weld. The, so that that is attached to the uh, bottom flange, some tug weld has been done, have been done. So that is the backing material. Now, some weld tabs have been placed. After placing the weld tabs, in the next picture you see that uh, actually the welding uh, complete joint penetration CJP groove weld. There, there is groove, you can see the groove. And the complete joint penetration is done in phases, in uh, phase by phase, little by little. And in the left bottom corner, you can see the CJP is complete. The, uh, for this reason, to complete the CJP, that is the, the access hole is required, that's why. That to, to, uh, so that the, we can use the stick, electric stick to, to uh, weld. Now, after doing that, the backing material is actually removed and all the weld tabs and backing materials, they are removed. You remember, it is mentioned that in this protected zone, no extra attachment can be there. All the attachment that are used during construction should be removed. So the backing material is removed. In the middle bottom picture, you can see the uh, top flange. Here again, you have the uh, backing material and uh, this is being prepared for the welding. And in the last picture you see the bottom flange is completely welded. The backing material uh, has been removed, the weld tags, uh, tabs have been removed and it is it has been ground properly. So this is the complete CJP welding. And after that, the requirement of the code is that this should be pre-qualified, John. The requirement is that the welding must be tested by non-destructive testing, NDT. So that is the complete process of uh, welding flange bottom, uh, the uh, beam flanges to the column flanges. So. I thought uh, this is interesting. That's why I just covered them. So that is the end of my lecture. So I have covered some topics on connections. I covered direct analysis method and I covered some provisions of uh, seismic provisions for, uh, for moment frames only. I didn't cover materials, uh, seismic provisions for brace frames, concentric brace frames or eccentric brace frame or uh, uh, truss, special truss moment frames. I didn't cover those topics because all of them are so different. Uh, each of them requires a lot more time to cover. So oh, the questions, I have many questions probably already. So, again, steel structure shed. This term is not there in the code. A steel structure shed building located in site class is D. Okay, this is site class, soil condition. And zone 4. Okay, from BNBC 2020, I will consider this as special steel moment frame. Okay, then the steel section have to be seismically compact, not everywhere, not everywhere. The code mentions where the steel sections have to be seismically compact. Okay. And this will create significant material weight increase and costing as the seismic effect for steel shed building is not much severe compared to multi-story building. Uh, what do you say? And this will create sigma and as the seismic effect for steel shed building is not much severe compared to multi-storied building, 
if I design the building with general non-compact section as per AISC code and maintain all serviceability, will this building be okay? First of all, uh, how did you say that as per AISC you will use non-compact section? I don't understand that. If, if you have to consider the seismic provisions, uh, even in AISC, AISC requires you to use seismically compact sections uh, for columns, for panel zones, for these areas, right? So you cannot avoid that. For second order effect, AISC has referred to response spectrum analysis on the other hand. AISC 36005 chapter C as revert to direct analysis. These are completely different, right? For stability analysis design, design on as response spectrum analysis is linear analysis and direct analysis is nonlinear in elastic design. Which method have to be followed? If I follow AISA, then do I have to design every building with direct analysis? You mean every steel building, right? So you have to follow AISC and in AISC in the bill, in present billing code BNBC 2020 uh, you, you, you don't need to use direct analysis method but in AISC 360 2016 direct analysis method is the primary method that is the suggested method that is the preferred method so I uh, I would recommend all steel design, structure designers to get accustomed to this direct analysis method as fast as possible because in near future this will be the, the preferred method of analysis. So it will always be better if you follow direct analysis method for designing steel structures. In Bangladesh, most of the real structure is sheds. Yeah, I mean, you mean uh, one or two storied height, right? They could be moment frames, they could be, uh, they, you mean truss at the roof, right? Sure. Okay, uh, but uh, that then that has to be truss moment frames. There has to be some lateral load carrying system. In Bangladesh, most of the steel structure is gable frame and there are some gable frame system too, yeah. Gable frame consisting of column, rafter, piling, sheet structures. In AISC, for such type of structure, different type of allowable horizontal sway, H by 60 or to H by 100 is provided in design guide 3, serviceability. Can we consider allowable sway as per AISC, H by 60 to H by 100? so much, so this is quite a lot, age by 60 or age to age by 100. Age by 500 for gable frame is too much conservative. Age by 500 is not um, required for seismic uh, loading. Age by 500 is for wind loading and for one or two story height uh, under wind loading, it will not go, <laughs> it will be uh, the, uh, so it will be very small. Allowable so for gable frame structure as per BNBC 2020 is big, is becoming big question in steel structure gable frame design. I don't agree with you. Age by 500 is not recommended in BNBC. It is only for wind loading combination. And for gable frame structures, uh, the so it will be much smaller for one or two story buildings. Uh, Okay, and then uh, rather up, uplift is a uh, major concern for low high cable frame buildings, the suction. But I have to check this H by 60 to H by 100 for cable frame design guide 3. Okay, but in, uh, in the AISC 360 
and there is no such provision. What is the standard procedure to check the steel plate material strength? By coupon test. Is it right uh, procedure to cut material from the finished eye section product or it should be checked before it is welded? Uh, it can be either, but but uh, you should collect the sample from some place which is uh, away from the welding. Because of the heat of the welding, there will be some residual stresses. Okay, so the better practice is to collect the samples before welding, and you collect uh, the coupons. You prepare we prepare coupon for the testing. Sir, we didn't get any dynamic analysis of structure. Yeah, I didn't cover that. Uh, do you have any plan on this session? I see uh, in this whole series, there is no uh, session on dynamic analysis. I didn't, I didn't notice that. It will be better for us if you could manage two dynamic analysis sessions on RCC and steel structures. Thanks. I don't think it will be possible this time. Uh, since uh, there were many topics that we wanted to include in this uh, series of webinars, but we couldn't. So dynamic analysis is one of them, uh, like analysis for flat, flat slab design. We couldn't we couldn't include that. So there are many topics we couldn't uh, include because of limitation of time. We have to finish by probably July. Uh, in mid-July, so we cannot cover these this time. Hopefully in future there will be opportunities when we can cover these topics too. Is it required to check the slenderness of flexural members for compression? Yes, of course. There are limits for that. Is there any size and thickness of steel beam and column? that has a fire rating of any kind. I didn't cover this part, yeah. For example, W200 by 8 size provides mono. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't depend on the size, I suppose. It doesn't depend only on the size. Okay. So I have to check. It doesn't only depend on the size. What is the allowable sway limit for single story industrial venture? The same, same question. There is no separate limit. Uh, the limits you have already learned, those are the limits. There is no separate limit for single street industrial street structure. Uh, sir, can you explain what amount of partial fixity we should consider and how to determine this? This is a very tricky question. There are many literatures on this topic. There are many papers, many uh, manuals, so depending on the uh, connection type, there can be many variations. And all those various types of connections show different moment rotation relationship. So usually for different types of partially restrained connections, peer connections, there are some uh, pre-qualified connections and there are some uh, manuals uh, for those pre-qualified connections and there the moment rotation relationships are given. You can find them in literature. Then from literature, you can uh, use them in your models. What is the R value of single story steel roof shed supported on masonry wall? This, this will be basically lateral load resisting system will be unreinforced masonry. So the R value will be for unreinforced masonry. Actually, this is not not recommended. This is not a uh, seismic system, lateral load resistance system, unreinforced masonry walls. If you reinforce, then you can uh, you can treat it as a lateral load resistance system. Dear sir, assalamu alaikum. Can we follow to check the serviceability of steel building AIC? Design Guide 3, Serviceability Design Consideration for Steel Buildings, and ASC Design Guide 7, Design Guide Industrial Buildings, Roofs to Anchor Rods, because I think there is a deficiency of information in BNBC 2020, 
Furthermore, Section 1012.2 of BNBC 2020 has referred to the Section 1.4 and 1.5.6 as well as Section 1.2.5, Table 6.2. I agree with you, Mr. Barry. Yeah, we can talk more about that. I completely agree with you that these are the deficiencies in BNBC 2020. You see, BNBC 2020 had to cover all types of materials like concrete, steel, masonry, uh, bamboo, timber, everything is there in the BNBC. So the BNBC could not be as extensive as you like to treat any individual type of uh, structural material. For steel, even in the chapter 10, only one chapter is there for structural steel design. But that, that is such is so huge because all of EISC3, almost all of EISC36005 had to be included there. And there are seismic provisions, so a different publication. And there are other publications for erection and uh, fabrication. So all those different publications, the summary of the, those publications, so the gist of those publications had to be included in the BNBC. So in the BNBC, it was impossible to consider everything. So you are absolutely right that BNBC 2020 is not comprehensive enough, uh, comprehensive enough to consider all the different issues related to structural steel design. So definitely BNBC 2020 is open uh, in, in the, if you can justify use of some other standard and if you can uh, show that the performance of the structure is acceptable, BNBC 2020 does not restrict you from using those standards. I think the same question is repeated again. In general, if there are any isolated footings that is considered as pin in the analysis, is there any calculation or considerations that an isolated footing considers as fixed support of an existing single story shed building? If yes, then please share the consideration. Okay. It doesn't depend only on the footing type. It depends on how you are anchoring your steel sections to the uh, footing. It, it rather depends more on that than on the footing. Okay. So uh, that is important, I think. In AISC 36005 for compression, KL by R is recommended 200, but why 150 in BNBC 2020? For compression, is it 200 in AC 36005? I thought BNBC followed completely AAC 36005. I have to check if it is 200. Would you please show us some practical example picture of slip critical and bearing type connections? Probably in future. In future, or what could be, I don't know how, uh, right now I don't have with me. So probably in future I can show. Uh, practical example, right? So I don't have any photographs with me right now. A steel structure is weak. In regard to fire resistance, and how fire resistance rating BNBC could be met in steel structure buildings? There is a short section on fire resistance of steel structure, but I found it that I found that that is not comprehensive enough again. So that's why actually I skipped that. So this is a long story. So what best I can say that for low-rise structures, like one-story, two-story structures, uh, the as fire section in part four of BNBC, the 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 restrictions are not that strict. There we can go for steel buildings. 
without any other treatment. But if we go for multi-storied steel buildings, we have to think for some kind of coating or cover on the steel. From where we can get easily the specific joint connection detailing for different steel moment frame, there are publications of AISC. There are publications like uh, uh, different types of pre-qualified. There, there is a dedicated publication on different pre-qualified -pre uh, connections. Dear sir, uh, for three-dimensional model of steel structure substructure should incorporate or not where con considering base plate connection is pin. If you consider base plate connection as pin, modeling of substructure, it depends if the soil is too soft, that soil structure interaction becomes important. But for steel structure, soil structure interaction is seldom uh, it seldom governs. So I don't think this is important to model the substructure. Please explain shortly as depend on BNBC 2020. Overall sway of gable frame, same question. We don't have any any separate provision for gable frames in the BNBC. Maybe design guideline 3 of IAIC has some provisions we have to see but not in the BNBC. Have there any provi uh, provision for a steel structure where connection not specifically designed for seismic reasons? So you mean existing structure that doesn't have proper detailing and you have to consider seismic provisions, then you have to go for retrofitting. Uh, for retrofitting, there are uh, other publications of AIC. It seems the, that the presentation slides have been modified and right. I'm sorry, uh, I, will, I will supply these slides to uh, Dr. Prabhudha and Maria, and I would like to request them to, uh, to uh, upload this new file so that you can download them. I'll do that. So can we get these lectures, videos, if we get them? We, we are talking about these and um, we need permission from Raju. Uh, if Raju permits, then they can be uh, uploaded to YouTube or uh, anywhere from, from where you can download. Uh, we're to, we, we have sought permission to Raju for that. And if Raju permits, then it will be provided. Dr. Rakib, uh, yes. we actually yes. we actually received permission from Rajiv I now. see. So we, so, uh, we have started oh, uploading. Really it has not been, the videos have not been shared yet, but it will be very, they will be very soon. That's a great news. Thank you <laughs> for that. So everybody will be happy, including me. I'll be very happy because I missed many lectures. I want to see them. Sir, can, uh, can you explain some of the fire requirements I skipped? Because the fire requirements that are included in the PMBC 2024 steel structures, uh, I felt that they are not comprehensive enough. So that's why I skipped them. So hopefully in future updates, they will become better. It, it connect, what connections of a truss is welded if connections of a truss is welded, then the connection has to a spinned or moment connections. Uh, I'm sorry, no. They cannot be moment connections. For, for truss moment frames, uh, they can be. They can be moment connections, but that is the topic of special truss moment frames. So there are details for that. So just just by welding a truss member to uh, column members does not produce a moment connection. There are other details. And that is discussed in the seismic provision of special truss moment frames. Either LRFD or ASD, what method do you suggest to follow? Obviously LRFD, there's no meaning using ASD anymore. I don't know why it's still there because 
it doesn't make your life easier. It's all the same. So I'll obviously recommend 11FT. Is it possible to use steel plate shear wall for building frame system? For building frame system, this is not classified as building frame system. This is classified differently. Uh, special steel plate shear wall system. Uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't, yeah, it is there. Probably I have to check because the, uh, the shear wall, steel shear walls will only take lateral forces, not gravity forces. So the gravity forces will be taken only by frame members. So that is building frame system. So I have to check if it is uh, classified like that in the in our table. I think so. This is steel building frame system. What type of structure will perform better in case of high seismic force? What type of structure will perform better in high seismic force? In for steel structures, there are some advantages because uh, steel structure the steel structure is usually lightweight because you are using thinner sections so the weight of the whole structure is much less as compared to concrete structures so that is one advantage you have with steel structure in size high seismic zones so from that point of view steel structures are preferred particularly for tall buildings too so I think these are the weather questions and I have covered all of them. So, uh, I myself is not satisfied with my lecture and with my answers. I have to study a lot more uh, because this is not a field of my specialty completely. But um, I tried to cover some important aspects of structural steel design. I hope that it will it it is useful for you and uh, for those who are new to steel structure new to st st steel structural design i i hope that this lecture may grow interest in you in steel structures and those who are already uh, practicing steel structural design i hope that you'll get some new materials from this lecture like direct analysis method and i suggest you to uh, go for these advanced methods from and catch these methods as early as you can because these are the uh, these are the trends that will come in near future so thank you so much for attending this lecture thank you